This episode of the AT Tips Cast is sponsored by the Practical and Fun Guide to Assistive Technology in Public Schools. Pirates, monsters, monkeys, and more keep you engaged as you learn tips, strategies, and insights that will help improve your assistive technology program. From setting up a stellar team to conducting consultations and evaluations, and from implementation to assessing success, this guide presents detailed advice to provide AT services that effectively and efficiently help all students. You can learn more about the book with the orange cover from the website www.isti.org slash chewat. That's isti.org slash chewat. Welcome to the AT Tips Cast, exploring and investigating the implementation of assistive technology in public schools. I'm your host, Chris Bouguet. This is episode 76 recorded on June 1st, 2011. If you're a longtime listener of the AT Tips cast, you'll know that I'm a proponent of the Universal Design for Learning framework. I've done episodes about it, in-person presentations about it, virtual presentations about it, webinars about it, I make videos about it, and I've even entered contests about it. And I won, too. Well, okay, second place is still winning, right? You could say that I drink the UDL juice, and even more than that, you could say that I'm a waiter who serves up healthy servings of UDL on a platter. But a few months ago, something happened that made me question the entire framework and its implementation as an educational philosophy. It was an event that shook my beliefs and practices to the core. It took a few months for me to process all my thoughts on the subject and formulate it in such a way that I could share what happened and what I, eventually, took away from it. I hope you'll stick with me as I share my little story, and, of course, I've embedded a few AT tips along the way. Myself and two of my colleagues have been working over the past few years to develop an AT tracking system for our AT team to use to help track the services we provide to our students, teachers, schools, and the school district in general. The goal of the system is to provide a common, streamlined approach to keeping track of our notes and keeping track of the services we've provided. Each member of our assistive technology team has their own methodologies for keeping track of the services they've provided. Some people like to print out pertinent email correspondence. Our emails get purged every 180 days, and they keep a paper-based file. Other archive email correspondence and keep all their notes in the email system. Sally Norton Dar, the co-author of the Practical and Fun Guide to Assistive Technology in Public Schools, likes to keep notes right in her digital calendar. Some digital calendar systems, like Google Calendar, have the ability to add notes to any event on the calendar. Users of Google Calendar can even search those notes later. For this reason, I'm going to call this AT Tip 201, Google Calendar for Notes because, it occurred to me, students could use the notes field of a Google Calendar as well for class projects or class content. Before the implementation of our tracking system, I was using an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of services. When I provided a service to a student or teacher or school, I'd go to my Excel spreadsheet where I had a student tab and a teacher tab and a school tab, and I'd right-click on the person's name, choose Insert or Edit Comment, and then leave my notes right there. Let's call Adding Comments to a Spreadsheet as AT Tip 202. Once again, students could keep notes or agenda items or lists of assignments right in the comments of a spreadsheet. Oh, and in case you're wondering, the spreadsheet version of Google Docs has this comment feature as well. In general, having our own processes for keeping our notes worked, except that if we wanted to share information with each other or with our supervisor, we often found it tricky. There was no central repository for all the information that could be reviewed, stored, or exchanged. If a student moved to one of my schools from a trainer who used a paper-based system, I had notes in multiple locations. When an administrator came to the AT supervisor asking questions about a service one of the trainers had provided, he couldn't immediately review a case history. Situations like these and more actually prompted the idea of a collaborative tracking system. Now that you understand the background, let me get to the event that made me question my belief in the Universal Design for Learning framework. My colleagues and I aren't application developers. We don't have the programming knowledge or experience to generate a system as robust as the one we wanted to develop. So we worked with our administrative technology department so that they could help us develop the tracking system. My two colleagues and I were discussing what we'd like the program to do, and the idea came up to have the system generate email reminders 
where an assistive technology trainer could enter a note and the system could then generate an email reminder 30 days later to follow up with that teacher. That's just one example of how the system could help prompt us to perform an even greater level of comprehensive service. On the flip side, however, that would mean an awful lot of extra emails coming into our inboxes. We debated the pros and cons of such a system and, moreover, discussed how the three of us could make a decision based on the variety of preferences and personalities we had on our team. Could we make a decision that was right for everyone? Then the answer hit us, UDL. If we followed our own beliefs, then we'd want to provide as many options to those other trainers as possible. What we really needed was a user preferences menu where each user could toggle on different aspects of the program according to their preferred styles. In this way, trainer A could have the email reminders and trainer B could have them turned off based on their personal preference. Moreover, trainers could try different settings for a period of time to see which setting worked best to match their individual styles. At the conclusion of the conversation, we all felt comfortable with and excited about the approach we were taking. Now, a few days later, we presented our outline to the administrative technology personnel who are actually going to be doing the programming. We explained why we needed a user preferences menu and the response that came back hit us, well, okay, hit me like a ton of bricks. I won't speak for my two colleagues. Administrative technology simply said that they didn't have the time or resources to build a user preferences menu for a staff of 10 people and that for a variety of different functions, like the email reminder system, we'd have to make a single choice that the team as a whole could live with. This floored me. Now don't get me wrong, I wasn't upset with the administrative technology people. They're juggling lots of balls, have budget concerns, other projects on their plate, and they were helping us out, so I didn't blame them at all for saying no. I understood the standpoint completely, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that I felt a little disappointed. In my mind, the analogy was simple. We were the students. Administrative technology was the instructor. The students were asking the instructor to help create an environment that provided multiple options for how they could learn, and the instructor was saying, I'd like to, but I can't. This was the event that sort of knocked my satellite out of orbit for a little bit, and it made me consider the long-term implications of a universal design for learning approach. What happens when a student goes through an entire 13-year educational process experiencing lessons presented in a way that best matches their style of learning, being able to express what they know with their preferred modality, and when they are engaged in a way that is always interesting and exciting to them? What if every student got to learn using their preferred modality and given as many options as possible? Then, when they leave school and transition to their next environment, they are told they can't use their preferred modality. What happens to the students when they get out into the workforce and the businesses they work for say, we need you to do it this way and only this way because we don't have the time, resources, or money to give you a variety of options. Here's the task. Complete it the way we want it completed. Go. As a practical example, is it acceptable to be in a business meeting, sitting around a table, listening to your boss give a description of a product or process and say, I'm sorry, I need some visuals, or do you have a movie I could watch on the subject? Is it acceptable when the boss says, I need a report written by next week to provide a multimedia slideshow instead because that's your preferred form of expression? I know these are kind of gross generalizations, but hopefully you see my point because this is the point I've been stewing on for months. If every student was experiencing their education with as many options as possible, would we be setting them up for disappointment or worse, failure, when they enter the workforce and they're told they only have limited options or worse, no options at all for how to complete a task they have to do? Well, as I said, this boggled my mind for a little while and in fact, this is how I originally thought I was going to end this episode. I was going to leave it open as a question for you, the listening audience, to digest and then report back your thoughts on. And I'd still love to hear your thoughts. Write me at attipscast at gmail.com or leave a comment at the blog attipscast.wordpress.com with what you think the future will look like if we accomplish the goal of a UDL approach for every school in America. I'd love to hear your visions of the future. Stopping there, however, felt to me like it was going to be the easy way out. So I forced myself to formulate my own answer. And my answer occurred to me after hearing stories and in fact even visiting workplaces that have embraced the notion I'm calling a universal design for working. The universal design for working would have similar principles outlined in the universal design for learning, except applied to a workplace environment. When a task needs to be accomplished, the company is set up in such a way that the employees have as many options as possible to complete the task. In fact, some research has already been done using this approach. 
The Disability and Business Technical Assistance Center has a nice PDF. The PDF explains workplaces that embrace universal design consider every aspect of their business against seven principles, which are as follows. 1. Equitable use. 2. Flexibility in use. 3. Simple and intuitive use. 4. Perceptible information. 5. Tolerance for error. 6. Low physical effort. 7. Size and space for approach and use. Listening to that list and hearing that the PDF I mentioned is from the Disability and Business Technical Assistance Center, you might conclude that the concept of universal design is about access to a workplace for a person with a disability. And you'd be right, it is. But it isn't only about people with disabilities. It's about what's best for everyone. Also, listening to that list and hearing that the PDF I mentioned is from the Disability and Business Technical Assistance Center, you might conclude that the concept of universal design is about access to the technology in a workplace. And again, you'd be right. It is. But it isn't only about technology. It's an overarching philosophy that can provide a rubric for any task a company wants completed. I think a good way to summarize the philosophy is with a heavy-hitting statement or tagline. So here it is. Universal design for working means expecting employees to complete a task using their preferred modality. You've probably already heard of some progressive companies who have adopted this philosophy, whether they know it's called universal design for working or not. Maybe you've read about the working environment at Google or Facebook. Back in December of 2010, Facebook was rated as the best place to work by Glassdoor.com, a site where employees rate their working environment. I'll have a link to an article about it on the blog site. When I was in Philadelphia for the American Speech Hearing Language Association conference, my cousin's boyfriend took us on a tour of his advertising firm's offices, showing me the collaborative workspaces and individual workspaces within. The company had an entire wall made out of a chalkboard so people could write down whatever they wanted on the wall with different colors of chalk. They had tabletops built out of dry erase material so people could write directly on the table when they were at a meeting and draw pictures. And they had projectors with electronic drop-down screens and an open break area where food and coffee is constantly present for people to nibble on, sit together, and chat about new ideas. In these examples, like Google, Facebook, and my cousin's advertising firm, the companies seem to be doing very well, and part of their success has to be because of how they've adopted, implemented, and cultivated a universal design for working approach. It seems apparent that these companies don't care how the work gets done, as long as it gets done. As an employer, the job is to provide an environment that attracts the best individuals to do the job, and where individuals can do their best work which in turn means they provide the best results. What's my vision for the future where students have experienced their education via universal design for learning approach? Well, I think we're already seeing the first sprouts from that seed, and I think we'll eventually see a forest. As more school systems adopt UDL and produce students who have had experiences and expectations to use their preferred learning styles, two things will happen. First, more companies will embrace the notion of universal design for working to attract these graduates. Second, more companies will be created from the get-go using this philosophy because they will be the products of students who have grown up knowing the power of choice. In the example I provided earlier, where the employees are sitting around a table in a business meeting, the boss won't just be lecturing them. The boss will be giving a description of a product and automatically include visuals, provide a movie, provide a manipulative, and so forth. Likewise, for the example where the boss demanded a written report, the expectation will change so that no boss will ever expect just one possible outcome. Rather, the expectation will be that the employees are free to accomplish the task however they so choose. And so now, once again, I can sleep at night. I can comfortably don my cummerbund and suit vest, drape a cloth over my arm, place the dishes on my serving platter, and march out into the restaurant comfortable in the knowledge that the stuff I'm serving won't make anyone sick and is, in fact, really healthy for them. So I hope I've given you something good to chew on. Thanks for paddling down my stream of consciousness with me. Geez, how many metaphors can I mix in one episode? I count three so far. Before I start getting metaphorically crazy, I'll wrap up by saying thanks to the Edceptional podcast and the Seedlings podcast, both of which invited me to be a guest on their shows. I had a blast on both shows and we delved into a lot of interesting topics. 
I'll have links to both of those shows on the blog site, attipscast.wordpress.com. If you're not already subscribed to those podcasts, you should be. Make room on your podcast listening doohickey and listen to those shows. You'll be engaged and learn a lot from each episode. Trust me, they are well worth your time. Speaking of time, it seems like time's just about up for this episode. May all your interventions be inclusive, may all your strategies be supportive, and may all your workplaces be universally designed.